Hi, good afternoon, everyone. If you're just joining, um, this is Michelle Fanger, and this is Immigration Times. And as you know, I'm on every Wednesday at 3 p.m. And um, I hope you're having a wonderful day. It is rainy here. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. But I hope you're here to do another interesting show. Well, sorry, I did not produce a volume. So I hope I see a few people on. Please share, tell your family and friends to join so that we could have a great discussion about immigration. If you have any questions, you could definitely put them in the chat. And I always say, if you're scared, you know, nervous, don't want to put any information in the chat, you can definitely send me an email at admin at firm dot com and I will respond to those questions and provide the answers on the show or respond to your email. So thanks for joining. Please share, share, tell your family and friends to join in for an informative show. And I touch on various topics that are important. And today I think I'm gonna focus on some issues that I've seen um, through my practice that individuals are having and um, I'm going to address those. But also, as I said, if you have any questions, you could definitely let me know so I could answer to them and share to your family and friends. I'm on at 3 p.m. Julia, good afternoon. Michelle Esquire, I just got the ping. Thank you, I appreciate it. I hope everybody knows how to get the ping. I don't know how to get the ping, but I think if you like the page, jamaicans.com, then you will see an update once I'm on. Um, Jay said, I sent you an email over a month ago and patiently waiting for a reply. I'm sorry I missed your email. Is it possible for you to resend that email? If not, what I'll do, I'll check that email later today and respond. I'll go through. And um, what was the email you used? Was it Jay? Because I hope it didn't go to my junk mail because sometimes some mails go. But if you want to send me the same message in messenger if you don't want to put it on here i could read it through my messenger on my other phone and then respond so i'm glad everybody's joining okay so what are we going to talk about today several things i think after the show i had last week um uscis made a major announcement which is good where they stated that individuals can now get a five-year work authorization that means instead of usually you first they had it for it was one year if you're going through the process you had to reapply but no then they changed it during covid to like two years but now they're saying that they're putting it to five years so that is really good because it's usually a headache i know with clients where they have to go reapply to get work authorization sometimes employers will be very adamant that they want the updated information and sometimes there are delays, which some jobs will like put you on hold until you actually get that document. So this is good that you have five years, usually hopefully before the five years, if you're going to the immigration process to get your green card, the entire process will be resolved before you get to the five year mark. So you wouldn't have to renew getting a work authorization. So that is big news in regards to immigration and that is welcome by everybody who is looking for work authorization and as you know work authorization you don't only get it by doing um through family but there are other ways of getting work authorization where you could apply for permission to work in the united states which as you see there are a lot of offers you now for individuals to come here to the united states to work because of the skilled labor force and the workforce actually they don't have quality workers or people who are willing to work so they're inviting a lot of individuals to come here to work so you see that people are using other avenues to migrate not only through family you have other ways such as if you have a special skills um you're an expert in your field or your job could sponsor you so these are ways to get it and um so I hope, and I'm glad everybody's joining in. And as I said, share with your family and friends. Um, you could share it on your page so people can see and learn. And after the show, you could definitely rewatch it if you are so inclined. Because I want the numbers to go up. And I'm on every Wednesday at 3 
p.m. So what's another thing that came to my office that I see that was a major thing, which to be honest, it was not the first time I've encountered such a scenario where an individual who is going through the process, the NBC process, meaning they're being processed outside of the country where they're failing um, the drug test. A lot of people are like, oh my God, they still do drug tests. Yes, they do do drug tests. Um, and you have to ensure that at the time you're scheduled for your interview or your testing, that you are not on any drugs or taking, I'm not taking drugs because of a medical condition. But you have to ensure that you are not on any drugs because if you do fail that test, they're not going to grant you the visa. And a lot of people might say marijuana, or they call it in Jamaica, Ganja, wherever you are, they might say, but it's legal. Um, people need to understand that federally, marijuana is not legalized. So it's still illegal, right? And if you are, if they find it in your blood, doing the blood test, that they will put your process on pause. What they'll do is that they'll give you additional time to get testing to see if you will show in your blood that you, you're not on drugs. But if it's consistent, you can actually get denied for having a drug problem, which is not good, all right? So be careful, like once you know, even your children, tell them because sometimes the younger ones, which I do realize it's usually the younger people, like you say, oh, your mom is petitioning for your stepdad, stop smoking, they think it's okay to smoke, but I'm not looking at the major impact. And people might say, oh, but you could mask it by, you know, drinking this, eating that, but it's still not good because there are still ways to detect that you're actually smoking. So my recommendation is that once it's sent to you that you have an interview date, in my opinion, stop smoking. Um, stop doing anything drug related. I hope you weren't doing it before, but if you have an interview or anything, if you are if you have a minor child, meaning they're young, under 21, encourage them not to smoke. They might not want to listen, but explain to them the consequence of it, right? And also you have to be careful of what charges you get if you are caught with drugs. Because I know like in Jamaica, like sometimes people be caught with a split. They don't read the terms of it because to them it's like, oh, I'm just gonna pay a fine. But if the charge is saying that you're trafficking drugs, that comes with a major impact for you immigration-wise. But that means you have a conviction of drug trafficking. So if you are caught with any drugs, and even if they say you're not gonna spend jail time, definitely go ahead and fight the case because you don't want a charge where it's saying that you're trafficking drugs or you know selling drugs or if you have a quantity. Usually if you're abusing drugs, there's ways to go about it, but being convicted of drug trafficking is one of the biggest no-no's. And other people might say, what is a little drugs? They look at what you're being charged with. And also if you're in the US, they look at your state and what your state see it as. They have to be careful of these kind of convictions that to me, if you are in any immigration process, if you're illegal right now, intend to sort out your status, if you go before and have a criminal case, I always recommend definitely go ahead and try to resolve it with an attorney that's also an immigration expert because they're more knowledgeable and they're able to tell you if they're more knowledgeable and they're able to tell you if the conviction will impact you immigration wise. Right. So I hope everybody's hearing me and I hope you're telling everybody have to be careful, have to be mindful. Also, one of the big no no's in immigration in regards to criminal conviction is also domestic violence. So you have to be careful. You cannot put your hand on anybody or sometimes a lot of people are very fearful because of their immigration status. They will not speak up and sometimes they will be the one that get charged. You have to be careful of that, too. As I said, don't look at the amount of time you're spending or the fact that you're going to be on probation. You have to look at what the charge is. So if it's for a domestic violence, that's a big no-no. It will impact you immigration-wise. So definitely, as I said, work with an attorney, specifically an immigration attorney that is knowledgeable 
about the law and the criminal aspect so that you don't plead to something that will impact you immigration wise which i've had a lot of those cases right so that's another major thing exact when you're going through the immigration process be mindful of stay away i say do not commit any crimes but things happen but if things happen be mindful try to use an attorney always speak to an immigration attorney if it's a criminal issue because they are more knowledgeable okay i don't see any questions coming in but definitely tell us your question if you have any questions or anything you have immigration wise and thank you for joining if you're just joining in it's your first time joining i'm michelle fanger and this is immigration times and i'm on every wednesday at 3 p.m i know the show is supposed to be 15 minutes but sometimes that quality a bit longer they haven't said anything to me but i need to talk to them to see if i could get more time but i do need people to tune in and also share to your family and friends to tune in to learn more about it what else have come across my desk that i think is very helpful for our community um for those individuals who are going through the process here okay i see a question from pat clayton if someone was deported, can they come back to the United States? Um, yes, depending on why they were deported, because people are, are have been deported for various reasons. Sometimes it's something minor as overstaying. Um, sometimes they're actually deported um, when they shouldn't have been, but because they didn't have legal representation, they were deported. Or sometimes they are individuals who were going through domestic abuse situations and because they didn't know like you know like you're supposed to say if you do this i'll send you back home they're being fearful just go home so usually and it's easier for those people because there is what's called the VAWA and it's for victim of abuse so you cannot only people think you only need to file it if you're in the united states but if you're outside of the united states and you're a victim of abuse and you do qualify you could file for the VAWA which will allow you to come back for other individuals um you could do what's called a waiver, which is basically, the waiver is basically asking the government permission to come back into the United States because you have been a good citizen while outside. Um, deportation for drug charges, depending on the drug charges. If it's trafficking, to be honest, highly unlikely that you'll be able to return to the United States because drug trafficking is one of the big no-no's. Right, but if it's a charge of abusing drugs, they might, they might be a little more lenient with you. But if it's for trafficking, um, you might have an issue with coming back. And it depends on the charges, so you'll have to look at it. Because what always happens in most cases is that some individuals don't fight their cases while they're here. And what is usually recommended is that you have the case revisited, where you have that criminal case reopened to see you'll have an attorney criminal an immigration attorney look at the case to see if it's best to have it reopened. And if it's reopened, then you're able to do a lesser charge and then which will allow you to come back. So so definitely if it's something to look into, but I say if it's for major drug trafficking, highly unlikely no. So it makes no sense to waste your money to be honest. Jerry said, do you have to adopt the child if you're filing for your wife and kid? Um, assuming you're talking about a stepchild, no, you don't. So if you are married to the, if you are married to the the mother of the children or the father of the children, before that child turned 18, um, then that's a step parent relationship. So as a step parent, you can just petition for the child as a step parent. You don't have to adopt the child. Does that make sense? Because adoption make it very sticky because you know with adoption once a child is adopted they're basically giving up any rights they have to the other parent so if in the future they decide and say all right i was adopted but i want to petition for my dad i'm 21 i want to petition for my dad they can't do it because they were adopted so that that relationship is cut but as a stepchild, if you petition for the child as a step parent, and that child decides to petition for their biological parent in the future, then they're able to. All right. Um, what if the child is 19? Okay, so the step parent relationship 
did not exist. It has to be before the child turned 18. So if the child is over 18, then it's not a step parent. You'll have to, what will have to happen is that the parent, say for instance, if it's the husband, your husband you petition for, then your husband then will have to petition for the child, his biological child. So usually if the if your husband gets it through marriage, after three years, he becomes a citizen. He could file with a green card, but when he becomes a citizen, it helps to fast track the application. So once he gets his um, green card, he could start the process. I say start the process then if you only have a green card so that it keeps that date as a priority date. And then when he becomes a citizen, he or she becomes a citizen, they could submit their citizenship documents, which will help push the application ahead. All right, I hope I answered your question and thank you all for your questions. And I'm glad everybody's joining in, share, tell your family and friends. It's a very informative show and I'm here to provide answers for you. So while I wait on um, information to come in, I'll touch on the topic that I was going to touch on for individuals who Kimberly said, thank you. You're welcome, Kimberly. It's a pleasure. If you have any more questions, you could definitely ask. Um, another thing is that individuals who are going, husband and wife, going through the immigration process while here in the United States and at the interview, one of the interviewers said, you know what? I don't believe this is a legitimate marriage. I believe it was done for fraud, through fraud, like you want to you know, circumvent the immigration process to get a benefit. I've had cases where people are in legitimate marriages, but you know, things happen whether they don't have enough proof. Oftentimes they don't use an attorney, but sometimes they don't have enough proof. Sometimes they, with the questioning, people get nervous. They don't respond accurately. And remember, you're only talking to a human being who is going to look at what they see and look at your questions and how you answer those questions and then make a decision. So if they do make a decision and say, you know what, I believe it was misrepresentation and fraud. I don't believe this is a legitimate marriage, but you know that it is a legitimate marriage. What you could have is have them revisit the case and um, present evidence to show that it is a legitimate marriage. But you have to go all out to establish, because as you know, they do not live with you. They do not know you, the officers doing these um, interviews. So you have to present your argument. You have to tell your story of why you are married and um, how in love you are. So you have to tell your story. And um, so you'll have to prove that. And sometimes, you know, like I've been in interviews where it goes on for three, four hours and you're like, what? But it's just because they're trying to establish that is a legitimate marriage because that's one of the most important things. It's up to you to prove your marriage. But the cases that I've seen that come across my desk where they're asking if the marriages are legitimate are basically individuals who don't have strong enough evidence because they haven't used the service of an attorney so they didn't really submit what they're required to submit, to establish. As I always say, if you're going to do it, even if you don't have the money to full on retain an attorney for the whole process, definitely work with an attorney to review, to have a consultation, to go through your case where they'll explain to you. Like for me, I usually explain the process, what needs to be done. So always do that. And if you're nervous about doing an interview and you don't know how to react, um, definitely work with an attorney to go. Gary said, can you have your attorney there during the interview? Yes, um, I'm usually present at the interview, but um, what we can do is very limited in interviews. So unless there's an outright violation, we cannot do anything. We cannot answer for you. You have to know, but what I usually do with my clients is I prepare them before interviews by questioning, you know, questions and answers, go over their evidence we submitted, highlight if we need additional evidence because sometimes at the point of submitting the application we do not have all the required evidence that we need or strong enough evidence so usually i prep um clients leading up to the interview question and answer random questions to keep them on their feet so they're prepared mentally for the interview they're prepared whether they're in the room together 
because oftentimes you don't have to be with your partner in that interview. They can separate you. They don't have to separate you because they suspect anything. They can just do it. And you have to be prepared mentally and be aware of the responses because you don't want to be off brand, meaning you're saying one thing, your partner is saying another thing. And that's when it becomes convoluted where they're like, what, what is going on here? Because they're literally asking you the same question and your spouse, they put it in separate rooms. But usually, yes, the attorneys can be there in the interview. I'm usually there in the interview. The great thing with COVID is that because of COVID, uh, we could do it telephonically. Some officers allow it, which is really great because usually um, you'd have to, I'd have to fly or travel. Although some clients still prefer that I actually fly to the location. But no, it's good where um, you could do it telephonically. So I could be on the phone while the interview is being held, which is oftentimes good because I'm able to hear the response and I could foresee if there's an issue that needs to be addressed. I'm very keen in listening and I always tell the clients, you know, to be calm, collected, and just answer the questions honestly. All right, any more questions? Cause it's a short show. You know, it should be longer, right? But it's a short show. And um, if you have any more questions, let me know. And I'm definitely going to go through my emails. As I said, I missed. I'm going to look through my junk if they're going to my junk. But if you have questions, you could definitely send them to admin at Banger Law Firm. I'm putting it in the chat. And... I'll answer it. And also for the show, if you go on jamaicans.com, like the show, once it's on, then you'll see that I'm on every Wednesday at 3 p.m. If it's your first time joining, I'm Michelle Fanger, and this is Immigration Times. And on the show, I try to answer any immigration questions that you might have and um, provide the answers if I can in this setting. And if you don't want to, ask your questions while I'm on the show. As I said, you can send me an email at admin at firm.com and I will gladly answer. So one of the last things I want to touch on, I think I touched on it briefly, is that um, try to be, if you're going through the immigration process, try to be mindful of, you know, what you get involved in and what you do. If you are going through the process, husband and wife, and you feel like you're being abused you do not have to sit within that marriage as you know there's an option what that's called a vow abuse doesn't have to be physical some people might say oh the person didn't hit me it could be financial abuse where um if you work your money that person takes your money or they don't give you money to buy necessities or i'm um, just verbally abusive whether they're saying i'm going to get you deported or if you don't do this you can't go there so those are forms of abuse um Sometimes you might say, oh, but I don't have proof of it. Um, the government understands that not all abuse victims are going to talk about it, especially immigrants. They're not going to run to the police. Not all will run to the police. But if you are able to give statements or have one person or two persons that you do speak to about what you're going through, then you're able to use that as a relief. So because I don't want people to stay in relationship just because they want to get a benefit or because a person knows that they're trying to get a benefit so they're taking advantage of it all right so um be aware of that nobody has to stay in any stay anywhere they're not wanted or take any abuse because of any um immigration benefits all right i don't see any more questions remember if you have any questions you could definitely ask i have a few more minutes before i hop off and then you definitely see me again next week, Wednesday. Um, definitely ask your questions. And when you do the application process, um, I was always asked, like sometimes people might say, oh, do I just submit one form or do I do everything? Um, I always say do everything all at once if you're in the United States, get it done um, and submit it. Um, I've been asked by individuals like, what is best to do, do I do? my process outside of Jamaica if I'm married or inside of Jamaica, I mean, outside of Jamaica or from Jamaica and do the process, the NVC process. 
Um, if you are married and you do intend to change your status, it is recommended that you do what's called a fiancé visa, like you do the process from outside of the country. But if you do come to the United States, say for instance, you, at the time you're not ready to adjust your status, but you want to travel back and forth for a while, but at, on one of your travels you decided, you know what, I'm just going to stay in the United States and get it done, you're able to. But at the time you're traveling to the United States, look at what your intent was. Was your intent to stay and adjust? So you have to be mindful of that because they're really thin, but I haven't had any issues through there. We have had issues in regards to immigration saying, oh yeah, you could have done it outside because you were married outside the country. But they do look at that. So you have to look at your intent um, when you're coming to the United States, what you intend to do. If you're coming here to visit, as I always say, make sure you're visiting. If it's a B1, B2 visa and you're coming to visit, make sure you're visiting. If you're just coming to work for a student visa, make sure it's a student visa. The good thing is that if you are here and you want to change status, you're able to. So if you do come here and have a visa and you do want to change it to a student visa, you're able to, as long as you don't overstay right um so just be mindful of that make sure while you're going through the process you look at your how long you're allowed to stay in the country funny thing is i've heard a lot of people say oh they didn't stop my passport they didn't give me the i-9 for nothing so i could stay here as long as i want but just to highlight all the people they no longer give been years now they no longer give you the actual i-9 for Sometimes the officers will tell you at the border, so the CPP, the CBP Custom and Border will tell you to go online to get your I-94, which you will go to the CBP.com website and look up for the I-94 and try to print out your I-94. On the I-94, it will tell you how long your visit is. The officers, because of time constraints, will not I bulge or say oh you have six weeks or you have two weeks unless it's extreme they'll tell you but you do have to go online so you don't have unlimited stay you have to go online to the CBP at the I-94 website and to pull up your information as to how long you're allowed stay in the United States all right so that is one because I've had a lot of Say, oh, I don't, I'm here unlimited, but no, you have to check online, and the I 94 is always available online, right? This has been going on for years, and um, I don't see any more questions, but I do see people joining in. I hope you enjoyed the show if you're just tuning in. Um, this is Michelle Fanger, and this is Immigration Times. Please like and share with your family and friends. I did enjoy the questions, bring all your questions. Um, I will answer those questions in regards to immigration. And um, if you like the live, please share, tell your family and friends I'm on every Wednesday at 3 p.m. And I thank you for joining me and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Long distance, thanks for the update. You're welcome. And I hope you join us next time. Julia said, thank you, Miss Michelle. You're welcome, Juliet. Um, share and tell your family and friends that I'm on every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.